Our next topic is going to be angular momentum, which for three-dimensional quantum mechanics is going to be key. So we're going to spend some time on this. Our first approach is we're going to start here with the uh, classical definition of angular momentum uh, using our quantum mechanical operators and develop some commutation relationships and we'll see that we can, uh, using that, uh, go through and uh, develop the full machinery of angular momentum. And then we'll do this in another way uh, for the next lecture. And so we can start out uh, using this determinant to figure out our cross product. Uh, I'm going to use x, y, and z hat as our unit vectors instead of i, j, and k, but of course uh, the book you're using might do that a little bit differently. And of course using this determinant we can go through and find the components uh, L, X, L, Y, and L, Z for our angular momentum. And of course, you know, doing this, so for the L, X, I would cover up this guy here, and you to, you know, Y times P, Z minus P, Z, uh, I'm sorry, P, Y times Z. And of course, since these op commute with each other, you can write it this way here. And so from this, we can develop our three components, uh, and then, of course, quantum mechanically, what we would want to do then is we can put in our operators for the x, y, and z components of our momentum. Uh, to make this uh, quantum mechanical in a sense. Now, again, it's going to be really amazing, but everything that we're going to do comes from looking at the commutation relationship. So we can set up here uh, Lx, Ly. So just taking those definitions we just wrote, uh, we get a commutator looking something kind of like this here. Uh, and so uh, this got, you know, basically two different pieces. And so what this ends up being is four uh, different commutation relationships. And sort of the key that we're going to use, um, and we, we've done this primarily in the x direction, but it works for any of the three directions. Okay, so here's our so our fundamental commutation relationship between the spatial component, so here are the z, and the momentum uh, in that direction, pz. So we've done this with x primarily, but we do it with x, y, and z. And so that commutation relationship comes out to i h bar. And so we look here, and one thing we can see is that basically uh, these two guys here, this one and this one, don't involve anything that does not commute, right? And so we got the z momentum and the x and the y position, so everything in there commutes. So that commutator is zero. The same thing for here, right? So again, there's no, it's only the same uh, direction. So the z spatial and the pz momentum, when it's the same, we have commutator. So these guys just completely uh, erase out of here and we can uh, melt this down uh, to a picture like this here. So what I've done here is in this case, okay, the ones that we're going to have a problem with the commutation would be the PZ and the Z. And so uh, the Y and the PX we can just slide out front. And similar for the PY and the X over here. And so we're le left here with basically variations of this commutator uh, over here. And so then uh, what I can do is uh, write this out a little bit. So here, okay, we've got the PZ and the Z uh, opposite of here, and so this is going to give us, so it'll be Y PX negative IH bar, and then plus PYX, and then this would just be uh, IH bar. And so further down here, I can pull out the IH bar and get something looking like this here. Again, these guys commute with each other, so I can be a little bit uh, sloppy uh, moving these around. And so I got IH bar times XPY minus, uh, so XPY minus YPX. And if you look over here uh, at, our, at our previous uh, slide, uh, what, what's in here is, a, is just going to be uh, the Z component. Uh, so, so long story short, our LX, LY commutation relationship, uh, these do not commute, and so it comes out to be IH bar LZ. So again, everything flows from this. So I would really stop here and make sure this makes sense to you. Maybe even just go through this really quickly. This is a pretty key relationship. So we can go through and, and find these commutation relationships. I've uh, thrown in here uh, the other two that you can work out. Um, so, so again, do that if you want. 
the key point is again, so we're going to start with these commutation relationships and from this develop the full machinery of angular momentum. But we also just want to stop and think about what this means, right? Whenever we have a commutation relationship like this, this means that uh, the two operators, so here in this case, Lx and Ly are incompatible observables, which means I cannot have a quantum state with a definite value of Lx or Ly. And of course, the same goes for the other two cases here. So it, we're going to find that it's advantageous for us to find operators that are compatible so that we can use that to help develop our states. And so, so this is really interesting, but we want to go back to the drawing board and see if we can find something that actually does commute. Uh, and what we're going to find that does commute is we're going to find that any one of these components, so in this case we'll we usually generally pick the LZ, will commute with this operator, which is the angular momentum total vector squared. Uh, which we can kind of write out as a Pythagorean theorem like this here. So this operator will work like this here. And so it'll be the operator of LZ with LX squared, LY squared, LZ squared. And so our goal is to go through and uh, compute this operator. So first of all, this one is zero because any operator commutes with itself or any version of itself. So squared over here. So that just goes away. Uh, and then now we're going to use, so, so I think we've actually seen this in, in, in our book, but it's the kind of thing you might have missed. Uh, but basically, uh, when we have two, uh, the commutator of an operator and an operator squared, this is one way to write it that can sometimes be handy and will be handy to us here. Uh, and so uh, this uh, commutator of LZ LX squared can be broken down to operator LX times commutator LZ LX and then commutator LZ LX times LX. And so these are equivalent. Uh, if you don't buy that, you can just sort of write it out real quickly and prove it to yourself. Uh, but when we write it out this way, we can then borrow these two commutator relationships that we uh, just developed uh, and to, to look at this here. So if we spread this out, so this will be LX, and so this is LZ LX, this will be this guy here. So it's IH bar LY. Uh, here, so it'll be plus, and then this is I h bar L y times L x. So these are our two terms here, plus uh, L y. So this L z L y. So this is actually backwards of the one we developed, and so that just means it's a negative. So this is negative I h bar L x. Then over here, so the same thing, negative I h bar L x L y. And so you'll see that like this piece cancels. Uh, with this guy over here, because the IH bar does commute with everything, it's just a constant, so we move that around. Uh, and this one here cancels out this one. So this, in fact, uh, does equal zero. And so this means that L squared operator and one of the components, again, typically we pick LZ, but we could pick any of the other ones. Uh, it's just sort of, we gotta pick one. Uh, commute, which means we're gonna be able to find states and here uh, we can sort of write these states out different ways, but we're going to be able to find um, quantum states that are uh, eigenstates of both the LZ and the L squared operators. And so sometimes you'll see people write this out uh, as some state that has an L and an M. So we're going to talk about what the L and the M stand for as we go on. And sometimes what those talk about is just some function F. Uh, it just sort of depends on, on who you're talking about. Uh, but we're going to go through now, we're going to try using these uh, statements here, right? So try to develop what these states are. And so simply we're just saying we have some state, F, that the LZ operator, when it acts on there, gives me some eigenvalue times F, and L squared times that F gives me uh, delta times that F. And so we're going to go through and try to develop that mu uh, and that delta uh, as we go through here. Now, the approach we're going to take is very similar to what we did with the harmonic oscillator. We're going to create an operator, which we know ahead of time is going to be the raising and lowering operator, uh, and it's going to be a sum of the two other operators. So we're, we're uh, going to try to develop states that are um, simultaneous eigenstates of the LZ operator and the L squared operator, and so this raising and lowering operator will be based on the other two components, LX and LY. And so we'll start here, again, developing some commutators. And so let's find the commutator of LZ uh, and the L, the raising and lowering operator. And we'll see as we go on uh, uh, why this is important. And just real quick, uh, you can very quickly find that, that the operator of L squared and L plus or minus is zero, right? Because uh, L squared commutes with any of the components. And so this raising operator is just uh, built on 
LX and LY. So the operator in question is going to be LZ, and again we're taking the operator with these two pieces here, so you can write something out kind of like this here, and again going back uh, to our commutation relations uh, previously involving the different uh, component, angular momentum component operators will get us this here. So this guy will be I h bar L y, and then plus or minus, and then I times negative I h bar L x, um, which we can then express as something kind of like this here. We can pull out uh, a plus or minus, we have plus or minus h bar times L x plus or minus I Ly, which then this of course leads us to the idea that this is equal to plus or minus h bar times L plus or minus. And so we're going to see that this is really key uh, in developing uh, the machinery that we're trying to develop. Again, uh, I encourage you to, to try all of these commutations just to get better at these uh, relationships and computing these things. So let's uh, see what these new raising and lowering operators can do for us raising and lowering operators can do for us. So we know, uh, we just talked about how L squared and L plus or minus commute. So what that means is I can set up an equation like this. Uh, since it doesn't matter what order these act in, L squared times L plus or minus times some function f should be the same thing as L plus or minus times L squared times that function f. And we're starting off with these ideas here. So our goal is to try to find this function f that we know can be a simultaneous eigenstate of Lz and L squared. And so we know there's an um, eigenvalue, eigenvector relationship like this, where we've called the eigenvalue for Lz mu and the eigenvalue for L squared uh, delta. And so over here, since I have this L squared acting directly here, I can have that just attack on that vector, and I know that gives me delta times f if this is in fact one of our eigenstates. Uh, since this is just a constant, I can rearrange this here and again in a very similar fashion to what we did with the harmonic oscillator then we can say well here I have an eigenvector relationship where the operator L squared acts on some eigenstate which is the operator L plus or minus times f it gives me back L plus or minus times f uh, times a constant delta. And in this case, it's actually the same constant delta. So in, in quantum mechanical language, this says that L plus or minus acting on F is an eigenstate of L squared with eigenvalue delta. And so this is, I'm sorry, eigenvalue lambda. Uh, I probably misstead that, but this is obviously a lambda. Now, the other side of this is a little more complicated, but a, a similar idea. So now if we look at the LZ operator and how it uh, commutes with L plus or minus, we just developed that it looks a little bit more complicated here. So what I can do is say, okay, LZ uh, times L plus or minus, all right, this is going to equal uh, L plus or minus LZ times F plus or minus h bar L plus or minus times F. And this is just writing out this commutator. Okay, what I've done is I wrote up this commutator uh, and then basically brought out the second part, the L plus or minus LZ over to this side over here and it turned positive. Uh, so we can go through and develop this and the same sort of idea over here, I can use this relationship. And so LZ times F gives me L plus or minus, uh, and this is that mu times the F plus or minus h bar, and then again I sort of slide that mu outside to get the L plus or minus F plus h bar uh, L plus or minus F. And so if I write this out, I can get mu plus or minus h bar times L plus or minus F. So again, we have this relationship here that says uh, the LZ operator acting on the eigenstate L plus or minus times F is equal to mu plus or minus H bar times the eigenstate L plus or minus times F. So in the quantum mechanical language, L plus or minus acting on F is an eigenstate of LZ with eigenvalue mu plus or minus H bar. And so with this, we essentially now have all the information we need to go through and, and uh, develop what we need to, the full machinery here. So. We've developed these two relationships here. 
Um, and let's just look at these a little bit. So, so first of all, we're, we're, we're trying to find the states of angular momentum. And so let's look at this. Well, so the state here uh, of L squared, which is essentially the, the length of our angular momentum vector, if you think if thinking about it in sort of a semi-classical way, that doesn't change with this raising or lowering, which hopefully makes sense. So, so basically you're raising and lowering uh, states of a, of a set L squared is what this is implying. Uh, and then over here, the z component does change in multiples of h bar as we raise or lower it. Um, and so we're, we're getting somewhere. And so the, the last thing uh, that we're going to sort of look at here, or, or the next thing, is so we imagine then that there's some f, we'll call it f top, uh, right, from raising all order, sort of like we did with the harmonic oscillator. There's some top rung where I can't raise it any further. Okay, so L plus times FT uh, is equal to zero. And so that's going to imply for us that uh, LZ times this F top gives us some maximum value, which we're going to call H bar times L. Uh, we'll see how this works out. Um, and then, of course, the thing is L squared times F top just gives us our lambda times F top, just like before. And so we're going to uh, take these relationships and kind of work from here hopefully try to develop what we're looking for. And uh, the last thing we're going to do that sort of is a helpful uh, computation here is we're going to look at this piece L plus or minus times L minus plus. Just using these definitions here, note that the one big difference is that the second one has a L minus plus. And so if I write these out and multiply them through, I get a LX squared, LY squared, and then two which you might want to call cross terms. And we can arrange these like so, such that this is a commutator, right? This thing here is just a commutator LX, LY, which we know this whole thing is IH bar times LZ. And so we can write this out as LX squared plus LY squared. And then this would be negative plus times I. And of course, that's IH bar LZ. So if I clean that up a little bit, I get L squared plus LY squared. And then this piece, the I, is a negative one. So basically it flips the sign of the plus and minus peach piece, uh, H bar LZ. Now, what will be convenient for us to do is to do a little trick. So LX squared plus LY squared is really close to L squared. It's just we would need to add in a plus LZ squared. And so to do that, we've got to pay the price of subtracting on LZ squared, but that's okay, right? Uh, that's not so bad. Um, and then we got in that plus or minus H bar LZ. And so if you remember, it's sometimes you can get kind of lost, is this is what is equal to this guy over here. And so what this will turn out to be is a very convenient ray for us to write L squared. So we can write L squared as L plus or minus L minus plus. So I'm basically going to isolate for L squared. And so it's equal to this thing. And then over here I'll have a plus LZ squared and then a minus plus H bar LZ. And so this will just allow us to calculate L squared much easier. So we're ready to start cooking here. And so let's look at this. Let's say that LZ times our function, which is the top function, is equal to h bar, and we'll call this L, as we said before, times the top function. And so now we can take L squared uh, and look at this same top function. And we're going to find out that if we do this, we can look at this and then figure out what the eigenvalues should be uh, for, for our states. And so let's do this. Now here I'll pick uh, a particular version of this, taking the bottom signs here. So L minus L plus plus LZ squared plus H bar LZ uh, all times F top. And if I do this, so this guy here, when I attack this on the top, uh, L plus, we can't raise this past the top, so that would be zero. So I get zero from the first piece. Uh, this guy here on F top, well, it's just applying LZ twice. And so it would be h bar L squared, and then this one here, h bar times LZ, would be h bar squared times L times this F top. And so if we clean this up a little bit, we get h bar squared L times L plus 1 
uh, f of top. And so our eigenvalue for this state, the top state, is h bar squared l times l plus 1. Now, let's do the same thing, but we're going to create now a bottom rung. And it's the same sort of idea. The bottom rung will be the lowest possible rung. And here, I'm going to call the eigenvalue to be h bar times some beta for the LZ operator. And so again, we're going to apply this special version of L squared, and now we apply the top sign. And you'll see in a second why that is. Uh, again, on this F bottom. And if I do that again, so if I attack this operator, L negative, we can't lower past the bottom. It's analogous to the top, so we get a zero. And then sort of the same sort of idea. So we get here plus H bar squared, my beta squared, and then minus. So this is H bar times the eigenvalue of LZ, which gives us an extra factor of H bar and beta times F bottom. And when we Again, like last time when we sort of go through and organize that, um, excuse me, I get the uh, eigenvalue to be B times B minus 1 times FB. So we found the eigenvalue for two states, our top state and the bottom state. We know, though, that the eigenvalue for L squared should be the same for all these states. So what we can do is equate these and try to figure out how um, L and beta compare. And this just leads to a quadratic equation like this here. Uh, definitely, as usual, suggest you go through and work this out. Uh, and when I solve this, I got that L is equal to negative one half plus or minus one half two beta plus one, which gives us, as usual, two solutions. Uh, L is negative beta and L is equal to beta negative one. Uh, negative one, sorry. Now, first of all, this solution here doesn't make any sense because that implies that L, which is our top, is higher than beta, and so it should be this one here. There's another way to, better, better way to think about that is beta is equal to uh, negative L. Okay, and that's again our eigenfunctions here. And so what this is saying is that if LZ times F to the top is equal to uh, H bar L, as we said before, then what that means is LZ times F to the bottom gets its negative H bar L to the top. I'm sorry, I should read that for the bottom. So again, what this means is the eigenvalue of the LZ operator on the top will be H bar L, and then for the LZ, the eigenvalue will be negative H bar L. And so we're almost done here. So at the point now, we're, we're able to kind of bring this all together. So again, we just showed that LZ times FT is equal to H bar times L for the top state. And then for the bottom state, it's negative H bar L. And again, remember that what we can do is using the raising and lowering, we can step up by values of one value of H bar. And so let's sort of think about what that means for us. And so here's our eigenvalue equations. So LZ times some general F is going to be H bar times our M value. L squared times F is going to be H bar squared times L, L plus 1 F. We're just going to sort of write it that way. And so what will happen is let's look at, say, the L equals to 1 state first. And so what that gives us is we have a L squared times our F for that particular uh, state will be uh, h bar squared times 2 times f. So our eigenvalue of L squared is h bar squared times 2. And what's going to happen is we're going to have our, um, if we did this for, say, the top state, that would be, for L equals to 1, would be h bar times f top. And LZ times f bottom would give us negative h bar. And so what that means is this m value here, for this particular case, uh, starts at negative 1, uh, and then again it, get, it increases by uh, values of h bar, which would mean it would be negative 1 to 0 to 1. Um, so again, what we have is this is our eigenvalue for the, the length squared of the angular momentum, and this is the eigenvalue for the component in the z direction. And so in this case here, uh, L squared eigenvalue is 2 times h bar, and then our LZ eigenvalue can be 
uh, negative h bar, h bar, or zero, where this m value steps up this way here. So to give maybe a little bit more of a complicated example, l equals to two, right? So that would be l squared f, and that by this equation here, it's gonna give us five h bar squared times f. And here our m value can range from negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So our, our top state would be two h bar, our bottom state would be negative two h bar, and every state in between that. And of course we could keep going to, to higher states uh, and sort of show how that same thing relates. So finally, we've been able to go through and figure out the eigenvector equations, eigenvalue equations for angular momentum for the LZ component and the L squared component of our states. Uh, and we did this strictly through operators and, and commutators. And so that's, uh, I think, pretty cool. We'll be spending a lot of time talking about angular momentum, and we're going to tie it back uh, to stuff we've talked about uh, with the Schrodinger equation. But just real quick, I just wanted to, to sort of give a little bit of insight. Uh, most books will discuss something like this. So if we look here again, uh, if we focus on the L equals to one state, all right, so here our uh, L squared eigenvalue is two H bar. And so if you imagine uh, that L would be the square root of that, so two H bar squared, uh, you get 1.41 H bar. Uh, and we look here, uh, uh, LZ, the maximum value of LZ, so LZ for the, for the top, right, we get as a value uh, of just H bar. So we get this weird situation where the length of the angular momentum vector is longer than the Z component. This is, this is the full Z component, what we would call uh, uh, the, the positive one Z component. Uh, and so that's the maximum you can have. So, so this is a situation where uh, again, this is the, the maximum value you have, and so what you can sort of think about is is because uh, the LZ component is not 1.41 h bar, uh, you can think about that in terms of the uncertainty of the other two directions, right? And so we, we can never know absolutely uh, that where the component is, right? So you would never have a situation where your Z component would be at 1.41 h bar or the maximum. So you can kind of frame this uh, in terms of the fact that, th that we have these incompatible observables. Um, okay, so there you go.